Okay, let's move on to some of the questions people made since last time. Here's uh, comments that people made. Uh, here's one fellow, and he says the following. He says, is light generated by the friction of the ropes? And uh, it's not really the friction of the ropes. What, what you have there really is uh, torsion. You, you have the in situ torsion, and it uh, uh, gives a, a little bump to each atom, the ones that are at each end of the rope. So both atoms receive constantly and simultaneously. You know, this little thump, this little torsion there where the threads um, uh, fork out and one becomes the electron shell and the other one becomes part of the proton dandelion, as we call it, okay? So uh, the threads make up the atoms and the atoms uh, on the other side, you have the threads come out again and turn into a rope. And so the whole universe, all the atoms in the universe are physically connected. And what you have is then they're doing their quantum jump, they're pumping back and forth what the what Niels Bohr thought was a little bead going back and forth between energy levels or orbitals. Uh, that's not what happens because you would have to explain why doesn't the bead fall completely, negative bead, right? Fall completely into the positive proton or why doesn't it spontaneously fly away? Why does it jump? between energy levels. Why can we find it there? You know, and that's, this explains it because it's a really a membrane, not a little bead. It's a membrane that's pumping back and forth at great speeds, vibrating, moving around, and while it does so, it torques the rope. So it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's torsion, it's not friction, okay? Uh, is there a tiny friction when uh, the, tor the rope torques? I don't know, I, I think not. I would. I would venture to say none. It's like if you have a rope, you torque it. I'm not sure there's any friction between the two threads, which is, I think, what he was referring to. Okay, okay here's uh, another thought. He says, the pond says, well, is the rope for light the same rope for gravity? Does gravity move at the speed of light? I'll answer the first, second question first. Now, gravity is instantaneous, you could say, which is the wrong word to use, because instantaneous, there's no such thing as instantaneous. Uh, we either have one frame of the universal movie, or we have two. And we have two, which is uh, what motion is about, two frames, right, two, two locations of every atom in the universe. Um, you can call it that motion cannot be instantaneous, because instantaneous really refers to what's in a single frame. So we cannot say that uh, gravity or anything is instantaneous. There, there cannot be. There's a contradiction in that term. We need to understand what we mean by instantaneous. And people think of that being motion that happens in a single frame. That cannot be possible. Mona Lisa needs two frames in order to smile, okay? Because smile is a verb, and verbs require two frames of the universal movie as a minimum, okay? And so the, uh, we just say that gravity acts instantaneously. Why? Because it's location specific. Weight is location specific. You, you're out there, you have an astronaut out there in the middle of space, right? And he's got a certain weight at a certain distance from the Earth. Let's say uh, 100 miles, right? He's 100 miles from the Earth, from the center of the Earth, or more, let's just say, a million miles from the center of the Earth, right? So he's very far away. All he has to do is move an inch, a millimeter forward, his weight already changes. Instantaneously in that sense, in the sense that once he changes location, his, cha his weight changes, gravity changes for that uh, after. Okay, in that sense, it's instantaneous. Location is instantaneous in the sense that once you move to another location, it's instantaneous once you're there. Okay, and that affects gravity instantaneously in the sense that gravity will change instant, uh, immediately as soon as you change your location. Okay, that's what we mean by instantaneous. But there is, instantaneous again is an irrational term. There is no such thing as instantaneous because it means that <clears throat> there's zero time and something happened. And there is time involved or uh, motion. There's a change in gravity as soon as you move a millimeter or even a micrometer, okay? Your, your weight already changed with respect to the object where you're measuring this, right? But now let's go with the first uh, uh, issue. Is the rope 
four light the same row for gravity? And uh, the answer is yes, but here we have to put it in the right context. Here it is. Uh, the rope is really the gut, the grand unified theory and the toe, the theory of everything that mathematicians have been looking for years. What do we mean by this? Well, if you're going to talk about gravity, we're saying, look, the gravity is mediated by all these ropes that connect every atom of, in this case, the example is a box, uh, to every atom on Earth. Okay, we didn't draw them all, just in case. So we have all these electromagnetic ropes binding one atom to every atom on Earth and vice versa, one atom on the Earth bound to every atom of the box. So it's by, uh, in both directions. And of course, I did not draw them all. Um, so what is that rope that interconnects every two atoms? Well, there you see it on the upper right. Okay, you have the 2D and the 3D version. They're pumping, doing their quantum jump, and what they're doing is torquing the rope. What goes along the rope, um, what propagates in both directions, is light. And at the same time, as the box moves closer to the Earth, and when there we have the example of the astronaut falling to Earth, as the astronaut gets closer to the Earth, the ropes fan out. So with the rope, we are able to do two mechanisms. Along the rope, any single rope, we have light. We have the uh, torsion known as light. And all the ropes produce this effect we call gravity, which is as the astronaut gets closer and closer to the center of the Earth, the ropes fan out, and that is a measure of the acceleration of gravity. That's what we call acceleration of gravity. And as you can see, it's a function of distance, just like Newton's uh, equation tells us. Okay, so that's, that's the context. So we have to put it in the proper context when we say, well, is the ropes the same thing as light? Is light the same thing as a rope? They are, in other words, the rope is the mediator, the physical mediator, okay? But light is a torsion along each rope, whereas gravity is the, uh, uh, all these ropes fanning out, the closer, we'll call it the acceleration of gravity is as the object approaches uh, the Earth, closer and closer, an asteroid could be an astronaut, whatever, as it approaches the Earth, the ropes fan out because every atom of that thing is bound to every atom that comprises the Earth. Okay, so those are the two mechanisms, one for light, one for gravity. We call it the grand unified theory or theory of everything because we need look no further. And here's an article that came out this week that kind of puts it also in the right perspective. Here you'll see it. Scientists shrunk the gap between atoms to an astounding 50 nanometers. What are they saying? What are they saying here? It says, after cooling the system to near absolute zero, right? Squeezing two diprosium atoms only 50 nanometers apart, the atoms displayed exotic quantum states. And what are these? Well, they are including magnetic interactions 1,000 times stronger than if the atoms were typically, were, were the typical 500 nanometers apart. So what are they saying? They got these two atoms closer together, right? They were able to do it at uh, cold temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. We don't care the conditions. We care about the explanation. It says one of these behaviors is an effect caused by an enhanced magnetic state where the two, uh, this uh, prosium atoms, a long distance connection with each other. Did I hear connection? Long distance, what? Connection with each other. They're connected, right? Transferred heat between layers separated by what? By a vacuum. Well, we have a contradiction with these fellows and against because these people don't understand their contradictions. On the one hand, they talk about connection, which is a physical term saying something is connected to something else Hopefully it's connected by a physical object, and these people say it's uh, separated by vacuum. Well, we got a contradiction. Either there's a physical object we cannot see or touch between the two atoms, or we have absolute vacuum, there's nothing between the two atoms. Which one is it? Okay? And then continues, another side effect was collective oscillation, where the vibration of one layer caused the other layer to vibrate simultaneously. When the atoms separate from each other, both of these effects dissipate, right? So when they separate them, uh, they don't have that uh, fuzzy little um, uh, magnetic or field or whatever you want to call it, uh, acting between the two atoms. Until now, heat between atoms could only be exchanged when they were in the same physical space and could collide. Now we have seen atomic layers separated by vacuum, again, 
Are we separated by vacuum or is there a physical object that we cannot see or touch? And they exchange heat via fluctuating magnetic fields. No, they can't do it uh, via magnetic fields because magnetic field is, not a con is a concept, it's not a physical object. You have to identify the object in physics. Otherwise, you cannot give a physical interpretation. And so what's the issue? The issue is that these people are really developing technology. And they call developing technology, they call that science. That's where the problem is. No, science has nothing to do with technology. Absolutely nothing. Science is about explaining. Technology is about developing gadgets, okay? And uh, there are two different, uh, you can say, disciplines or activities. One has nothing to do with the other. Now, if you can develop technology because you have this insight, extra insight from science, more power to you. I'm just saying these two things are separate. Uh, technology is one thing and uh, science is another. What these people cannot do is explain. They are not scientists, they are technologists, they are mathematicians who want to do technology or develop technology for computing or for whatever. None of that has anything to do with physics or with science. Science, you need to explain. You need to tell me how it works, what the mechanism is. If you can't, you're not a scientist. That's how simple it is. And for that, we need to define what science is. Nobody has done so in the last 400 years, since the so-called scientific <laughs> revolution. Okay, here, another file says, fields, forces, energies are physical. Well, for that, you need to define what physical is. Physical, that which has shape. That's what physical means, okay? And field is a bunch of numbers, uh, so that's not anything that has shape. Force, uh, there's push or pull, two verbs. That doesn't have shape. Verbs don't have shape. And energy is defined as the capacity, blah, 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 blah. And the capacity is not a physical object. Okay? So none of these qualify as physical. Very straightforward, very simple. Okay? Hopefully anyone can understand that. Okay, here we have another fellow. He says the following. Yeah, since atoms attract each other due to magnetic influencing, dipole induction, it's an electric phenomenon. Okay, so why should macroscopic attraction of the Earth be any different? Atoms are magnets, because magnets are made from atoms. Uh -huh. Well, I don't know what monastery uh, this fall studied in. All he's got to do is tell us, he says electricity or magnetism or whatever uh, fields uh, pull two atoms together. Well, we want him to give us a mechanism of how any of those does it. How does electricity pull those two atoms together? How does magnetism pull those two atoms together? That's all he's got to show us. You, you know, illustrate a mechanism. Show us how that atom, which is the atom they're using, if you've got a different atom, more power to you, okay? Because that is an irrational atom. But that is the atom that is taught in schools all over the planet. It's the Bohr atom, Bohr Rutherford atom. We have the Bohr... Uh, Rutherford's proton and uh, Bohr's electron there, <laughs> little bead jumping back and forth. That's that's the atom. And you, all you got to do is show us the mechanism of how atom, one atom attracts another. So once you can do that, you can show us how magnetism or electricity or whatever you believe uh, in, uh, how it works, how, how it acts to get two atoms together. Only then can you talk about, you know, saying, okay, how does the sun attract the earth? Is it through electricity, through magnetism? First do two atoms, then we'll extrapolate that to, you know, bigger stuff like planets and other um, uh, celestial objects. Okay, so here we have another fun. He says the following. He says, uh, in lead dioxide, pH, uh, PbOH, uh, O2, I'm sorry, which is used as the active material to the uh, positive plate of the battery, the uh, lead atom is in the plus four oxidation state. This is because each oxygen atom has an oxidation state of minus two. So balance the charges in the molecule, the lead atom must have an oxidation rate of plus four. Yeah, uh, what he's saying is that a lot of this just math, okay? And uh, with this math, they are able to uh, describe, not explain really, but describe what is happening during a reaction. In fact, this is just one reaction. You can apply uh, uh, this to any chemical reaction. Essentially, you have to balance what's on the left with what's on the right, okay? On the other side of the green arrow there, okay? 
But it's important to note that this doesn't mean that the lead atom is short of four electrons. Rather, it means that in the context of the molecule, the lead atom has effectively lost four electrons to the oxygen atoms. That's interesting because he says it doesn't mean the lead atom is short of four electrons, but then he says four electrons uh, are donated or go to the oxygen atoms. And again, this is why all these people do a lot of math, but they have no uh, explanation. They cannot illustrate what they're talking about. Because if the uh, electrons move, if they are lost to the oxygen atoms, then I don't know how he can say, on the other hand, that doesn't mean that the lead atom is short for electrons. What do you mean they're not? He just donated them. So again, it's, it's, uh, they have all these contradictions because they cannot illustrate what they're talking about. They cannot tell you what the mechanism is. That's the issue. In the context of the lead acid battery, the OH group does not exist freely, but is part of the water H2O and sulfuric acid H2SO4 molecules. During the battery's operation, these molecules participate in various reactions, but the OH group itself does not carry a charge of minus four. Yeah, and again, um, uh, the problem that this fellow has is that he's uh, wanting to talk about uh, the chemical math, the mathematics of a chemical reaction. That's what he's talking about. And, uh, you know, the video that I put up uh, this week on, uh, on this uh, refers really to something else. We're, we're, we're not doing math, we're doing physics. The math we just took from quantum mechanics, and again, it's what's on one side of the green arrow, and you equate it to what's on the other side, and they better match, you know, the, the numbers have to match. But that doesn't mean that that, that uh, math represents what's happening in the real world as far as the physics of it, what's, fat, what's happening qualitatively, what physical interpretation do we give to this? That's the issue. And uh, what we're saying essentially in that video is, because that's going to lead to the following video, um, is that somehow, somehow, the chemical reaction compels, compels the lead, okay, on the right, to turn, uh, I think it, uh, we had that going um, clockwise, okay, or if it's counterclockwise, no problem, but it's taken all the way all around to the other side where you have um, a different chemical, uh, different chemicals there, and what it does is, hopefully, if it's clockwise over here, it's counterclockwise at the other end, and vice versa. Okay, if you just take a rope and you have it in a curve pointing towards you, if you turn this one counterclockwise, eventually that counterclockwise will turn into clockwise on your other hand. Okay, and vice versa. If you turn it clockwise, you know, that'll go all around and you'll see that on your left hand, you're going to have it counterclockwise. So all we're talking about is that there's going to be a chemical reaction in the H2SO4, you know, and what it does is compel the atoms that form the wire or whatever you have there, uh, hopefully it's some kind of lead wire, um, to move in the counterclockwise direction and then comes out in uh, the other end as, as clockwise. This positive and negative that quantum talks about, Mother Nature doesn't understand what positive and neg negative are. She does understand clockwise and counterclockwise. That is physics. Plus and minus, positive, negative, north, south, that's all garbage coming from math. Mother Nature never went to school. She doesn't understand math, especially human math, okay? And again, this is all this fellow has to do. He's got to tell us what the atom looks like before he can talk about, you know, losing electrons and gaining electrons and all that kind of stuff that he talked about just now. Now, you got to tell me, you know, what your atom looks like to begin with before you tell me how it lost an electron. And right now, this, uh, elect this atom that you see there is an irrational atom. It's a, a Bohr-Rutherford uh, atom, and they have this little bead negative bead that somehow, you know, falls and uh, rises from, uh, to and from energy levels and of orbitals, whatever. And what we're talking about is why does that electron bead remain faithful to the proton center? Okay, that's the only issue we've got to answer. And there is no answer to that. To this day, after 100 years of so-called quantum mechanics, we still don't have an answer to this question which was, by the way, uh, incidentally, you know, the 
question that led us to uh, investigate the electron. Why doesn't it fall to the nucleus? And here we are 100 years later, we have an answer to this question. A, a math mathematical physicists, you know, mathematicians, uh, they have not been able to answer this question. Why doesn't the electron bead, negative electron bead, why doesn't it get attracted to the positive proton if positive attracts negative? And they can't answer that question. And the answer is simple. Uh, orbitals are not orbitals. What they are is a membrane. What we have, the electron is a membrane and that encapsulates the proton star. Okay? So we have a different model of the atom. We can explain it, but the mathematicians who rely on the Niels Bohr, uh, Ernst Rutherford model, they cannot answer, and they never will, because it's the wrong model. It's an irrational model. Not wrong, it's an irrational one, because you cannot justify it. That's the whole issue. And final question that a fellow uh, or said, uh, asked there, says, it may pain you to know that Einstein also came to understand the necessity of an ether. I believe that is what he's referring to in the letter about fields. Okay, and yeah, uh, Einstein wrote a book on the ether as it relates to relativity theory. There you see it. Uh, and the Einstein ether theory is a modified theory of gravity that breaks Lorentz symmetry by introducing a dynamical vector field called the ether. And Einstein in uh, 1920 gave a, um, a talk over there at the University of Leiden. And he says the following said, we may say that according to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. Okay? According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. Okay? So uh, was Einstein an etherist? Uh, well, he was, remember, in the 19th century, they still hadn't uh, this, uh, you know, gotten rid of the ether. And so uh, Einstein was born in, what, 79, 1879. So he was an etherist by education, you know. And so th these people were still talking about the ether. That was kind of this, uh, displaced or replaced, you could say, uh, by space-time on the one hand and the false vacuum that uh, quantum mechanics has today, the, this so-called vacuum. Both of them, both space-time and false vacuum, anything coming out of mathematical physics, physics is uh, ether. It's, these are all ether theories because ether simply means bunch of particles and they serve as a background. Some of them think of them as a uh, sandbox. All the things are fixed. You know, the grains are fixed. They're just sitting there. And others think of it as like an ocean or as air that these particles are moving around. So there's these different notions of the ether, but they're all particles. Uh, you know, mathematical physics, since the days of the Greeks, has always been particles. That's the background, particles. And that's what the ether has been, and that's what it still is today. They talk about particles coming from space. What do you mean particles of uh, space? Uh, are you saying that they are, first of all, are they round? If they're round, what's in the inter interstices? So there is, so you have to tell me what's between, what separates one particle from the other. That's the first issue. The other one is, uh, you know, you have all these particles, so when they come in, whether it leaves a hole behind in space, a hole in space, a hole in nothing. If not, what is space? Is space, is, is space made of all these particles? Uh, if it is, when you pull one into the real world, a you know, virtual particle for a split second, did it leave a hole behind? You know, so there's lots of questions there, and you know, what what you end up uh, uh, eventually believing <laughs> or understanding is that uh, not only is quantum and ether theory, yeah, it is, but um, they haven't solved the problem. They haven't solved the what is space. That's the issue. And uh, either space is made of particles, or particles are occupying space, which means you still haven't told us what space is. And you can't say empty space because space is empty. It's uh, like saying empty, empty or space, space. You're saying the same word twice, you know. So, uh, yeah, you need to define what space is. And none of these people have ever done so. That's the issue.